In this tutorial, we're going to talk about deriving reflection and transmission coefficients for a three-layer system. What we've seen so far is a two-layer case with a material with refractive index n1 and a refractive index n2 on the other side, a boundary at x equals zero. We have an incoming plane wave characterized by k, reflected wave characterized by k prime wave vector, and a transmitted wave characterized by a q wave vector. What we're going to add to this problem is the following. We're going to make a second interface like this and make that at x equals d. So d now is the thickness of this second layer. That might, for instance, be a coating on a lens. So we've got a trying to anti-reflection coat the lens. And the additional things we have to add to this system now are that we're going to now have a reflection at this second interface. So now it's possible for there to be a reflected wave, which we characterize with a wave vector q prime, analogous to this k prime. And we now have a, a third material. So that gets a refractive index n3. And we've got a transmitted beam that comes out into this material. And that we're going to characterize with another letter, p, transmitted wave vector p. This material N3 goes on forever, so there's no reflection at the other side of it, so there isn't a returning wave vector P prime. So we've got five total wave vectors here. We will consider S polarized light. So we're going to have an incoming beam polarized like that, where there's some E in characterizing the incident beam's amplitude of the plane wave. And then we can talk about the relative amplitudes of these six plane waves. The incident wave has a magnitude I'll write in yellow, which will by convention just sort of say one. The reflected wave has a reflection coefficient r sub s, s for the s polarized light. And then we've got these, the transmitted wave at the end has our traditional label ts. These two inside waves in this layer we're going to give new names to, we're going to call F sub S and G sub S. So this then is our entire setup for the problem. Our unknowns are the four fractions of one. How much, how it's the strength of RS, FS, GS, and TS. And just to get everything squared away, let's make sure we remember that all of these beams are plane waves with a certain lang a certain form and that's going to be important when we do any math on them. So let's just remind that the incident beam is written in the following form. It's got a magnitude, E incident, that's some number. It's got a vector direction, which in our XYZ coordinate system coming out of the page at you is Z hat, S polarized light. And then there's the exponential. We've seen this repeatedly by now. And now there's five different waves. And let's remember is that what's different about the five waves is just two things in the expression. The first wave has E incident and the relative amount, the fraction of E incident that this beam has is a full amount. So that has an amplitude of one for the incident beam. And the incident beam has a wave vector K. And then we've got the reflected beam, where we would have RS times E incident here. So we would multiply in front by an RS. And that corresponds to this reflected wave vector K prime. And now we note that K and K prime have equal Y components and opposite X components. And it's the latter thing that I want to make that note of here, that KX prime equals negative KX, as we saw when we derived single layer Fresnel reflection coefficients. Then we've got three more terms, FS, GS, and TS. The FS beam has a wave vector Q, but otherwise is still a plane wave just like this. GS has a Q prime vector. And we'll note again in parallel that QX prime equals negative qx. These two beams have equal and opposite x components as well by the same logic. 
because they have the same y components and ts and p so this little map here lets you remember that all five of these waves are plane waves and for instance when we take derivatives of these plane waves we're going to bring down a factor of an i times a k sort of term you'll see that in a minute and it's true for all five of the beams we will remember that in all cases we have e to the i k y y that is equal to e to the i q y y which equals e to the i p y y all of the y components of all five of these wave vectors are identical that's what leads to Snell's law and we're going to quickly be able to sort of ignore the y dependence of all of these beams because they all have exactly the same dependence now we want to know what's the electric field at some particular point in space could be in any one of the media and we if we want in general to consider some point P relative to some origin O and there's some location wave uh, location vector R that tells us about that let's go ahead and write an expression for E1 we're in the first medium at some location in that first medium some location R and time T there are two waves in that medium there is an E to be very explicit there's an E incident Z hat I'll just copy what I've got up here plus this is the way I'll write the reflect beam that it's RS E incident that's the amount of electric field amplitude it has Z hat E to the I K prime dot R minus omega T and just to continue on I won't write an expression for E3 but I will say what E2 is equal to so E2 is a function of R and T I won't write that is equal to FS times E incident and then the propagation for that here's the first beam and then the second beam is the G beam so that's going to be G sub S times E incident Z hat and now since this is the reflected or counter propagating thing this is a Q prime vector dotted into R hat minus omega T so I've got an expression now for E1 and I'll put brackets around this this gives me an expression for E2 we'll set that off as sort of our mathematical baseline that we've established now we have to establish the boundary conditions at each interface let's remind ourselves what they are so boundary conditions at each interface and as we've talked about there's two conditions at each interface the uh, first condition is that the electric field on the left is going to equal the electric field on the right that's what we would what we might call the E parallel condition the parallel component electric field across an interface is always equal so the field itself is continuous remember the entire electric field is parallel to the interface so E total is E parallel so at our first interface E left equals E right that's also true at the second interface so that's the field being continuous and then the second thing is that the slopes of those fields are also the same on the interface so the electric field transition is smooth so de left dx equals de right dx things we've asserted before this is again a condition on the slope being continuous across the interface for the s polarized electric field so now if we're going to start solving this four unknowns equation there's four unknowns here rs through ts and we've got two boundaries and each boundary is going to give us two equations one two so let's just start setting this up i'm not going to do absolutely everything but we're going to do a lot of it so at x equals zero what do we know note that k dot r 
is going to be a completely ignorable term because all, all of the y parts of these dot products are all the same. We've said this so many times by now. So they'll all cancel out. The x component of this dot product, the kxx, will cancel out because x equals 0. And there is no z component. So everything about these exponentials goes away. And then we're just left with the, the amounts of e incident for all four of these beams. On the left-hand side, we just have one amount of the incident beam plus the RS amount of the reflected beam. So that's the strength of the electric field on the left. All other terms in here are common to every term and therefore cancel out. And on the right-hand side, we have the FS amplitude of this term plus the GS amplitude of this term. Again, it's sort of surprising that with all of this stuff written up here, we get such a simple looking equation, but that's what it is at x equals zero. So we've got our first equation. The second equation on slope, that's a little bit more complicated. Let's just look at the first term up here. When we take the x derivative of this term, the only thing that comes down is an i k x. We're taking, if you will, the derivative of something which has the form e to the i k x x dot dot dot. There's a lot of other stuff in here, but it has no x dependence. So when we take an x derivative of this expression, we get the expression itself, which is an amplitude of 1, and out in front, we'll get an i k x. That's what happens when you take the derivative of that expression. So i k x times a 1. For the reflection term, we're going to get i k x prime times rs. We can still cancel out all the y dependence and the x dependence doesn't exist here because x equals zero. So that's what we get for the slope terms on the left hand side. And if we just follow the same form on the right hand side, we get an iqx multiplying the fs and we get an iqx prime multiplying the gs. First of all, we can cancel out all of the i's, so that's not important. We group the kx and the kx prime together. We write them with a common, we just write them as kx, and we got 1 minus rs on this side. And here, same thing, qx and qx prime are related, so we can group this in terms of qx and get fs minus gs. So we're halfway there now. We've got equation number one, and we've got equation number two. So we need two more equations. So now we're going to go to the other boundary. So what's going on at x equals d? This one gets a little more sophisticated because what's no longer true is that all of the e all of the terms look like e to the i something x these don't all go to one anymore because we're not sticking in a zero where the x is so what's going on at this second interface here we have two waves on the left the amplitude of the first wave if we just plug in for what's this term equal to at x equals d it's going to be equal to fs, but then we also have to write the x dependence of this exponential term, and that's e to the i qx d. Right, the x displacement is d, so when we have e to the i q dot r, we're going to get an e to the i qx d, which is not the same, say, in this next term. This next term has an amplitude gs, but it has an e to the i, a qx prime. Its term is going to be minus i qx d. Now here we didn't have that problem because fs and gs both had e to the i qx zero. So they, had ex so they just had ones. Here, these terms are no longer equal. We can't choose them to be equal because we already anchored them at x equals 0, x equals d is just a different place now. 
So in general, these two exponentials are not equal. And then we've got the TS term on the other side, and that's e to the i px d. Now we've got a third equation. Now I'm not going to specify what that fourth equation is right now. That's going to be a slope equation, which is very analogous to this expression here. But once again, in that equation, the 1, rs, fs, and gs are going to all have these exponential-like terms associated with them, as well as having these derivatives that come out the same way over here. So you're going to get a fourth equation, which you'll have to work out. Just to summarize that now, we've got two boundaries. We've got a total of four equations. And we've got four unknowns. So you can now simply solve for RS, TS, which are the ones you're probably most interested in, and you also get FS and GS. So this is the setup for how you're going to go ahead and actually solve for what these coefficients are as a function of refractive index, incident angle, and thickness of the layer.